that kind of deal, huh? <laughs> Are you looking out? Uh, Feels like, like that's my signature. People, like, <laughs> I'm not concerned about that stuff anymore. Are we, are we rolling? Yeah, we are oh. rolling. I, by the way, this whole week, um, I've been talking to people, and I've been uh, when I've been telling people who we were going to be interviewing next. Every time I've been telling people, I'm like, you know, we're we're, we're doing Bill Camp next, and they're like, Are you serious? I fucking love him. Hmm. It seems like so many people really, really. They don't do. know me. Oh, they they really. <laughs> it's it's funny. Maybe uh, maybe if you're, I don't know if you get this, but maybe if you're walking down the street, maybe a lot of people won't recognize you. But whenever you mention a character or from something, a show or a film you've done, people immediately remember you. Hmm. Immediately, and so many people do love so many of the roles and so many of the parts you play. Um, how do you? Well, let's let, actually we could start there. How do you? How do you pick? It seems like the shows you do or the films you do, the roles are so, there's something about them that uh, people never forget. I mean, they might not even be, it might not be even be a massive thing, but it's a, it's, it's a role that people that, that kind of has a lot to do with the story. And sometimes even if you're not on screen, um, is that something that you look for personally when you're looking for roles or, or do they just happen to come to you that way? How do you decide on what roles you're going to take? One thing I don't do is look for roles. Okay. Yeah. Just... <laughs> it's real, no, to be perfectly honest, yeah. I, they come to me and uh, I have very little uh, to do with what comes to me. I'm not proactive in that way. Mm -hmm. I don't scour stuff. I'm not looking around for stuff. Uh, um, you must get a ton of I'm stuff just, that you turn down, though, don't you? Or how do you decide which one you're nah, going to do? Not a lot, you know. Really? Uh, there are some things I do because, um, well, what I do generally is if if uh, the role speaks to me in some way in terms of like what we were just talking about with Shanley in terms of what makes John such an awesome writer is he has... He's able to create voices, like distinctive voices, mm -hmm. from character to character and character. Not all scripts have that. They sort of they sort of have this one weird authorial kind of voice that goes all the way through. And to me, that is it makes them it, it can make a a script homogenous. And then I don't really want to get into it. Mm -hmm. But uh, but I'm just really lucky that you know the the characters and the scripts that come to me and uh you know 95 percent of that i don't really turn a lot down so usually i turn stuff down because i i can't make it work in terms Time of schedule because of my family like personal mm -hmm. and my wife works too so we have to try and find right, balance, balance because we're also trying to raise a teenager <laughs> right? and uh so no i'm just really lucky man you yeah. know, a lot of these, a lot of these characters are people. You know, great writers came up with them. Yeah, they really are. Well, speaking of family, maybe we could get into a little bit about where you grew up, how you got into acting. What um, did you always want to be an actor from a young? No, nope. uh, when you were young, no. No, nope. uh, I wanted to be a baseball player. Really? Were you good? Were you that uh, good? I was. I was. Uh, yeah, wow. I was a good baseball player. Nice. I was. Um, and then I. And then. Uh, and then I broke my leg playing hockey because I also played hockey, which I also love. And I, I, I still play hockey. Mm -hmm. I don't still play baseball, though. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, so that sort of went off to the side. And then... Um, you grew the, up in Massachusetts? I grew up in Massachusetts. I grew up at a boarding school that my father taught at. Oh, okay. A very small uh, Episcopalian boarding school. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also attended that school, mm -hmm. um, and I didn't do any acting at that school except in my senior year. Nice. Did and you I, do plays in the senior year? Or yeah, I, I co-directed a play called Tigers, uh, with a classmate of mine. And then I also acted in The Crucible. In high school? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. That's <laughs> yeah. quite an undertaking. Yeah, I what mean, a play. Did, you did I the played Crucible Giles. Yeah, I did it on Broadway, Broadway a few years yeah. ago. Yeah with, yeah, with Ben and. Yeah, that's so. The first time you did that was was in high school. First time I did it was in high school, and I played wow. Giles Corey. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, I played the part that the great Jim Norton played on Broadway a few years yeah. ago, crushed by stones. 
Um, yep. And then, uh, and then no, I and then I sort of you know knocked around the idea of wanting to be a journalist, and then uh, that didn't go anywhere. And you know, I was really just I don't know. I was concerned with you know girls and sports and <laughs> having fun, and yeah. went to college in Vermont. Okay. Um, but I kept going for a semester and then dropping, taking time off and then going back a semester and so. so I ended up really only completing a couple of years of uh, undergraduate, mm -hmm. and I was a classics major. I was a Latin major because yeah. I had done a lot of Latin in high school, five years of translating Latin, and I had mm -hmm. some really good teachers, and I really dug it. And uh, they had a pretty good Latin department at UVM, oddly enough. And I had to declare some kind of major, so I was <laughs> like, <laughs> and my and the only involvement I ever had with like theater and stuff was I had a work study job in the scene shop as a carpenter at the Royal Tyler Theater in uh, at the University of Vermont. So I was I was there You're building I was, sets. Yeah. Oh wow. That's what I was doing. I had oh. I wasn't involved in the theater department that's so interesting. Uh, in any kind of official capacity other than like pounding nails and building flats and painting flats and <laughs> props and stuff like that and hanging out in the scene shop with like three other guys. <laughs> and uh, and then I got through that job. I got a job. This is kind of an interesting story. Uh, I got a job working <clears throat> in the local like stagehand. You know, they started a, a IATSE union up there. Okay. Yeah, local 991. Uh, you know, so it's the local, you know. Yeah. Uh, I think local one is here in New York, right? Mm hmm And uh, and so I would make my money Got it. doing, you know, work in load-ins and show calls and strikes for rock shows and <laughs> touring Broadway shows because they had a Broadway house up there. And, right. They had turned it into a union house. And so I was really lucky as an 18, 19 year old getting these calls, never getting any sleep yeah. and uh, living a very unhealthy lifestyle. But nonetheless, I was, you know, I was I was kind of in this, I guess, entertainment scene. And one day I was working a load in for a touring production of Skin of Our Teeth okay. that the acting company was doing. Right. And the acting company was the theater company that the the Juilliard graduates would join once they got out of school. That was sort of a practice that got discontinued after, you know, a certain number of a couple of decades or something. But originally that was sort of the vision that uh, that, that program had mm -hmm. at Juilliard with John Hausman and Michelle Sandini. Was that they would have they were they were building an ensemble company, a touring rep company, and that's what a lot of those early classes did was that they would go out and tour the country, and maybe even Canada, uh, and do a rep season. They're just on the road, mm -hmm. which is kind of it, that doesn't exist anymore. It doesn't, yeah. It doesn't, and yeah, it's yeah. really really kind of shameful, but yeah. unfortunately that's the way it is. Yeah, and uh, um as difficult as I'm sure that was, but I was standing in the theater during the load in and it was like, you know, our load in was probably eight, nine in the morning and around 10 30, 11 o'clock, these definitely not stagehands, but looked like young actors and actresses and, you know, young people coming in. They started like doing vocal exercises in the space, like not on the stage, but in the house. Right. They started exploring the acoustics of the house. Mm -hmm. I was like, what the fuck? Are they like, doing? Yeah. this is crazy. Yeah. I, you know, I've never seen this. Yeah. It's fascinating to me. Right. The, and the thing that impressed me the most was these people are really committed. Yeah. They're really committed. Like, this is a craft to them, right? right. They weren't just showing up and doing their thing. Right. They were there every day exploring their environment. And, okay, now we got to play in this place. Yeah. I got to figure it out. And uh, that was a whole new landscape for me. And so I, I found out, where are these people from? And they were all Juilliard grads. And that's why this And I thought, <laughs> hmm, that's interesting. And I watched them and I thought, well, you know, I think I can probably, you know, 
I had been watching people perform, you know, shows and thinking, I can do that. But you had no, <laughs> before you auditioned for Juilliard, you had no formal training? No, no formal wow. training at all. I had, uh, I, I had done, I had done some plays like, like I was a carpenter for a Shakespeare festival up there called the Champlain Shakespeare Festival. And uh, there were three of us, each of us had a show because they would do three shows each summer. And uh, it was a good Shakespeare festival. I think they actually did the entire canon, one of the few uh, in North America. And uh, once after that, that summer as a carpenter, I think my show, what was my show? My show, I think, was was uh, Importance of Being Earnest, I think, which they did, as well as Henry IV, no, Henry VI, one and two, and Richard III. Um, and then uh, I thought, well, next summer I think I'll audition. Cool. For, for the plays? or, or Yeah, the and I auditioned, and I got a couple of, you know, I, I got a couple of smaller little things like Comedy of Errors, The Messenger, and Dr. Pinch's, uh, you know, assistant and something else. And uh, But the guy who was the director uh, was from Moscow, Idaho, where they had a PATP program, Professional Actor Training Program. And there were some actors from that, that program. Mm -hmm. And he offered me a full ride. He was like, I would like you to come to Moscow, wow. Idaho, <laughs> and, <laughs> and be in our school, which I think was a three-year program. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, that'd be cool. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, I don't want to go to Moscow, Idaho, because right. I had a conversation with my parents. and My dad was like, really? You want to go on? And so no, I stayed. I stayed in Vermont, and then and then that <clears throat> my last semester at UV, at UVM was eighty fall of eighty four. I think I did a couple of plays that, uh, um, like I I toured around doing children's theater with a friend of mine mm -hmm. who was uh, a year or so ahead of me, but he adapted Aesop's Fables, and we turned them into. Uh, children's shows that we then through the student, you know, or student council or something at UVM, mm -hmm. there were funds to go around and tour the oh, schools, nice. you know, in Vermont. So we did that. And then we did a play that uh, he found called Answers. And we asked the head of the department, because um, we were techies, it was like, can we can we use the stage for like three days? Right. He was like, yeah, okay. And so we put on a show for like three nights and that was really fun. And then one of the teachers, uh, you know, there, um, who was in the art department, who was somebody that I was taking a class with in the art, in the art department said, uh, I'm going to New York. Would you like to come with a couple other guys? And we went to see, uh, we went to see a couple of shows in New York. Like I, I saw Swimming to Cambodia with uh, Spalding Gray down on Worcester Street. It was like mm -hmm. one of the early performances of that and LSD. And, uh, and then we saw later, we saw a show at the theater I'm performing at right now at the Minute of Lane. We saw a production of Balm and Gilead nice. that Steppenwolf and Circle did. Um, was and it I after? was like, I'm coming here. Oh, nice. That's when you decided you wanted to go to come to New York? Yeah, I was like, what the hell? You know, I have no other direction, really. Mm -hmm. uh, I enjoy acting. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to get a couple of audition pieces together, and I'm going to audition for all of the schools that are supposedly the best training programs. Right. So I did. What was the... So that's maybe something we could, we could talk about. The audition process at Juilliard. What was that like? I'm sure it's... It, is it very intense or... Um, was yeah, it... it was, it was, uh, you know, they were all kind of, they all sort of had the same level of intensity depending on how you regarded it, you know? Yeah, you have to put together a, a, a contemporary and then a classical monologue. Yeah, I did, a, I did, I adapted a bit of um, Catcher in the Rye. Nice. I took, 
I took a piece out of out of there, a couple of pages, and put them together. So when he's talking about his little brother Allie, who's dead, and talking about his baseball glove, and I did that, and I did Trinculo from uh, The Tempest. Nice. And yeah. And what was Juilliard like the time that you were there with the the teachers? Um, I'm sure you guys did a ton of plays while you were there. We would do, uh, I'd say, yeah, we would do a minimum of, I, uh, I think it was three a year. And then it, and then in our, uh, maybe in the fourth year, I know in the fourth year there were, we would do a rep. So the fourth year is kind of dedicated entirely to production, right. uh, which I think is a great, great idea. Although, you know, the third year was a little difficult. I sort of think over the four years, I, I was kind of, you know, all in for three and a third of those four <laughs> years. Uh, we had a difficult third year, our class. Mm -hmm. It's a long time to spend with 15 other people. Oh, is that what it is? It's just 15 of you? That's mm -hmm. how big our class was. Oh. We were 16. Uh, but um, it's a long time. That is a long time. And uh, so, yeah, in the fourth year, you do four shows in rap. Got it. You know, you do a Shakespeare and then usually a musical and then a sort of more modern play. We did a Len Jenkins play called Dark Ride. And then uh, I couldn't tell you what the musical was because it was a Kaufman musical or something. I am, I'm not a musical theater person, so mm -hmm. I was not cast in it. Uh, and then I would, we did Lear and we did uh, Camino Real by nice. Tennessee Williams. Amazing. Is that where you 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 have a very distinct voice and a very It's all cigarettes and whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like but I feel like you have you must well, I I've, I've also seen you on stage and you have a wonderful wonderful voice on stage. So I'm I'm assuming there was a lot of voice work done there. Yeah, voice uh yeah. Alexander um those two classes are the two classes that as far as I remember and it was so long ago now, yeah. uh, that actually one does for the entire four years. Wow. Voice production and Alexander. Yeah. yeah they're, import they're still important even now. I mean, a lot of people uh, suggest doing Alexander. Yeah, work. yeah, no. I mean, those yeah. are things that I'm conscious of uh, every night now mm -hmm. when I'm on stage. And yeah. I should be more conscious of... Uh, when I'm doing camera work, probably, but that's different sort of technical stuff. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, how is it? So everything I learned at that place, man, I'm still using and still thinking about and still trying to figure out yeah, how yeah, to I'm apply. Sure, I'm sure. It's also a lot of information, you know, acting training, years and years and years of it. You're just like, there's so much information. Sometimes you just need a refresher. I, I feel that way. I'm just like, oh, yeah, I for yeah, maybe I need to go back. I go back to class all the time. You I, do? I do, yeah. Um, and I you do back. scene work and stuff? Is De that it? Definitely. Yeah. Scene work, voice work, um, right. all sorts of stuff. Just to just to stay fresh yeah. for me, you know? Yeah. Also, I mean, yeah, yeah that's really it. Yeah. Um, you do a lot of, you, you've done a lot of stage, you've done a lot of TV, you've done a lot of film. How do you approach the characters on a stage differently. I was I was listening to an interview you did. Um, I think they were talking. You guys were talking about. Um, I forget what exactly the word you guys use, but um, uh, immersion or like or or making them uh, the characters lively or, or something like that. I forget exactly what it was you guys were speaking about. Um, but I, I also wanted to touch on that a little bit. You know, on stage, you know, characters are usually you know you have the. You have the ability to go a little bit larger than life, you know, mostly because you do have your you you do have to use your voice a little bit more to you know reach the audience and all that sort of stuff. How do you um, do you think? How do you approach characters in film or TV that way? When um, you know you can't use, I guess maybe maybe the camera angle is probably tight on you, and you don't have the you know, the luxury of a whole stage or, or anything like that, and you want to give a, a similar full performance, let's say. <clears throat> does that make sense? <laughs> no, it does. Absolutely, no, it, totally, it totally makes sense. It totally makes sense. First, my, my... So on stage, and this is, you know, this is... A, and this is something I learned at Juilliard from one of, you know, the, my greatest 
teachers uh, was that on stage, uh, it's not about realism. Do you know? Yeah. It's not something because the form is such mm -hmm. that it's like behaviorism in a naturalistic way is at least for me, uh, it has to be a little up here right. when it's on stage. Mm -hmm. So anybody that I'm not performing for people who are going to the theater to look like they're watching television. Got it. Yep. Or, or, or to experience a television thing. Right. But live. Right. You know, to me, that's uninteresting. That's not what theater is. It's not. Yeah. Theater is a, you know, it, it's just a little up here. Right. So that gives us, right, as actors, it gives us a little bit of a wider landscape. Mm -hmm. But you have to also make sure it's not, right. you know, it, it, you could go full on like balloon an ensemble doing <laughs> ball or something, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, which would be awesome, mm -hmm. you know, but we don't do that here. <laughs> right. You know, unfortunately. Yeah. We are kind of obsessed with this like. Uh, realism, like it's like, you know, yeah. whatever. Uh, and so there are moments I love, and that's the kind of most of the theater I've done in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the directors I've worked with, yeah, they're not real. They're, they're, they're a little outside the box. Yeah. You know, and I enjoyed that because that to me is interesting because I don't, I, who wants to go see another effing production of that play? Yeah. Again, the same, just different faces. I agree. Do you know? Yeah. So that's the 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 thing in Freedom Weather that happens in in the theater space. Mm -hmm. And as performers, we have to have our technical chops and skills a little bit better. Right. Because we're in that. Arena. frame yeah. we're in that arena right yeah we have to be able to do these things mm -hmm. in a in like you know if something's really tight on me with a camera or there are two cameras really tight or there's we're trying to get a tight and a medium you know whatever at the same mm -hmm. time and i have to be conscious of both mm -hmm. um i don't really think you know, I'm mic'd as well, you know, right. we're, we're always exactly, mic'd. Yeah. So we have, and that's another thing which makes me insane. And I will go on record right now saying, there is absolutely no effing reason people need to be microphoned in the theater. Yes, yeah. Sorry, yeah. I had to say it. No, I, I, it is I, I a agree. wicked pet peeve of mine. I agree. People that, that are like, yep. anyways, I'll leave yeah. it at that. But so, uh, if, you can't, if you can't fill a space, mm -hmm. you shouldn't be on the stage. I agree. If you can't get in there and you can't get like, like, all right, 99 people, 250 people, that's one thing. But if you strive to call yourself a theater actor mm -hmm. and like ho somebody offers you, okay, I would like you to go on stage and play, you know, Biff and Death of a Salesman. Mm -hmm. And you can't fill, you know, yep. that 780 foot that seat theater. Right. With your own voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> well, speaking of Death of a Salesman, you did do Death of a Salesman. <clears throat> um, I would love to talk about that a little bit. You worked with the late great, one of my favorites, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. What was that experience like? What was like? What was it like? I love Death of a Salesman is one of my favorite plays. Um, I love uh, love Arthur Miller. And um, uh, one well, he was a guy who also had. He said that, you know, well, his plays, I think he said all of them were written as emergency speak. So just by virtue of saying it, this script is emergency speak, it puts it in a state of this, right? Yeah. So there's no back foot. There's no cool sort of, you know, mm -hmm. we're just hanging. Yeah. And talking and blah, blah, blah. And being, you know, yeah. there's an urgency that's up here now. That's so right. that, and that. And I also think. As far as I understand, he was not a fan of studio theater mm. and that kind of acting, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, think he, I think he thought it, like, destroyed American theater. Filled it? No, not oh, Phil. Oh, Arthur, oh, Miller. Oh, Arthur Miller. Oh, okay. I was confused there. I don't know what there. Phil thought. About <laughs> yeah, 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 you yeah, know, yeah. Studio, studio theater. And yeah. what was that guy's name? Who was the studio theater actor teacher, you know? 
Everybody's guru. Um, I always forget that guy's that? name. No, no, no. Who? Uh, uh, you know, whatever. I'm sure I'll get. Yeah. <laughs> well, what was it like working with um, with uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman? What was that production? The experience you had on that uh, play it must have been um, must have been amazing. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, it was an incredible cast. Yeah, you know. Yeah, um, and uh, an amazing play. Yeah, it really is. You a know, great it's, play. Yeah. it's an amazing, amazing play. So it was a real privilege, the whole thing, all the way around. What was the first? Um, what was the first Broadway show you did? First Broadway show I did was. Uh, I can't remember if it was. Seagull, or if it was... Oh, you did the... Who did you play in the Seagull? I understudied Ethan. Oh, cool. Hawk. Oh, uh, who did Ethan play? Triplet? Yep. Oh. And uh, Laura Linney was... Arcadinia? No, or Nina? No, no, Nina. Nina, yeah. No, we were all very young. <laughs> Sorry. We were all very young. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that was play. Tyne Daly. Uh, and John Voight played... John Voight played... Oh, I, I remember the Trigorin. Trigorin, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 I remember now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my wife um, did three weeks of Masha. Amazing. In the same production? Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. And I understood Ethan. Never went out for Ethan, of course, because that guy is a fucking monster. He's really amazing. Um, yes. Um, and uh, you guys should get him on your show. You should talk to that motherfucker. <laughs> that would uh, be awesome. Got great I, I saw too. him do, um, I saw him uh, right be uh, before, I think, uh, 2019. He did um, True West with Paul yeah. Dano. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I saw that. It was wonderful. Yeah. I did not see that one. Yeah. It was very, very good. Um, so, you yeah. know, it's, I wanted to ask you this question to see what you thought. It seems like back in the day when people were coming up in New York, all of the actors would kind of, there was this pipeline through the theater to come up and then they would go on and become famous, um, but they would get discovered in, in the theater. That's kind of how it, it felt like it was back in the day. You know, the Meryl Streep's of the world and all these people would come up through a New York theater and then they would go on to do film and TV and all sorts of stuff. I almost feel like it's the opposite now. I almost feel like you have to go on and become famous in film and TV and then they come back to do Broadway. Um, are you noticing that? Is it because the th I'm, I'm assuming it's because it's so hard to fill seats or, or the ticket prices and it's so expensive to do plays that they need giant stars? Uh, I, I don't I don't know. I feel like the, that route is is not really that available anymore. I don't know if I'm wrong or 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 I, I just don't know. I thought I'd maybe ask uh, maybe you you I'm sure I have no insight into that <laughs> other than I, I observe kind of the same thing. Yeah. Yep. I think a lot of it has to do with, uh, I don't know, it's our culture of celebrity. Yeah. Uh, I think that, uh, yeah, they're trying to make money. They're trying to fill seats. Uh, I have a, I have some real strong feelings about, about uh, why, you know, yeah, about productions of Shakespeare shows that they do on Broadway and, the act, and you know, the people that they ask, you know. Definitely, like, I feel the same why way, yeah. do we not? Like, we got an awful lot of really good Shakespearean actors in this country. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, all sorts of, you know, anyways. Uh, yeah, and I, f I feel like back then theater was a place where producers would go and, and look for actors to put in their films. And um, I almost feel like that, that, that kind of doesn't exist anymore. I feel like mm, that really doesn't really happen. But it's, yeah, it's hard know. to break I through think... in theater now. Um, yes, absolutely. I, yeah. I think, uh, you know, I, it's almost like if you're, if you're a director or a writer, you have a, mm -hmm. a, a, you know, more of a chance to, to land a theater gig. Right. That's, that's one going to be able to pay your rent or feed you. Right. You know, you don't make any money as an actor in, in the theater. Right. So there's that reality, which is like, you know, yeah. Uh, and then in order to survive, 
you you want to you know the only the paying jobs are the ones that are up on Broadway, right? And they don't do a whole a lot of legitimate theater up there on Broadway. Yeah. Right now, it's particularly difficult. Yeah. So, yeah, they just they need to have those names, and you know if they can find a a person who's a screen actor or a television actor who's willing to get on a stage. Yeah. You know, and not all of them are because yeah. it's a terrifying experience. It takes a lot of balls. It, does. A lot, it takes a lot of guts and courage to actually do that. Especially when you're famous. You know, it's sure, like Sure, because you put you're putting everything on the line, exactly. right? Exactly. I mean, and and it's t I mean, you know, it's like you get on a stage. <laughs> it's a different totally different animal. Yeah. Than acting on a set with I mean, I'm I'm not saying anything new, but yeah, but yeah, yeah, you know, you open yourself up to a lot of, you know, vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I do want to talk about some of the work you've done on TV because I love some of the stuff you've done. Um, I am just uh, I was when I started watching Queen's Gambit, I was just like, how did they like what an idea for a show? Mm. And just well, the book, you know. Yeah, yeah, but I, I just I felt I feel like if somebody pitched it, like I feel like uh, like ah, a show about chess or whatever, like it, it wouldn't be something that I think a lot of people would be interested in doing. That was Scott because they had tried Alan had tried to make that oh, for a while. Oh, did they? Oh, yeah, ah, yeah, as a film. Ah. And then uh, it was really Scott that had the brilliant idea. Scott Frank, you, the writer, and the yeah, of having yeah. the the you know. Using the format of of episodic, yeah, what was it seven? I think there was. I don't remember exactly how many, but yeah, it was. Yeah, it was like one season of it's whatever perfect it was. Perfect way to tell that story. You, the, the the genius of of his writing, uh, Scotts, is the the way they kept your character alive throughout the story, even when you weren't on mm. on on screen. It was, it was almost like you couldn't have the show without Mr. Scheibel. It, it wouldn't exist. Also, her story wouldn't be anywhere near as meaningful or deep without that character. It's almost like she comes full circle back to him. It starts with him. And then I don't I haven't seen I haven't seen it in a long time, but I think it ends. Does the show end after I think it ends when she comes back to the orphanage and goes into the room, doesn't it? I, I don't quite remember. I think it kind of ends. No, out. the show ends actually on a on a, a sidewalk. I think in Moscow, right? She's gone Maybe. to play in like oh, yeah, the yeah, world yeah, yeah, championship, yeah. and she wins. Right, right, right. And right, right. she's dressed in those gorgeous clothes with a white hat and stuff. Right, and she right, goes right. out and 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 she's she's walking along, and there's like a kind of Washington Square Park deal where it's all these old old guys, you know, in the cold playing mm -hmm. chess. And she sits down. One of them, I think, invites her. Right. So it's a little bit of a sort of like flashback of when he says, "Okay, you can sit and play." Right. 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 After she hounds him and so persistent, and then she sits down and starts playing with this old man, right? Which I guess is, you know, I, I don't someone know. thought it was me. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> called my mom and was like, "Was that him <laughs> at the end? What was he doing in Moscow?" <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> I was when I was watching that. I thought to myself, if I was playing Mr. Scheibel as an actor, do you think he had his own children? Good question. Very good question. I was wondering. Are if you, you? You want me to answer that question? I don't know. I was. I, I, I just. I, I wasn't. I wasn't I'm sure. Not, I wasn't sure if you. I. I, I think I would. Thought of it. Yes. Yeah. Did you think? Yeah. About yeah, it? yeah. Absolutely. I'm not going to yeah. tell you stuff, okay, but like. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 I like. I, I was like, maybe I can maybe get it someday, out of him. I don't know. Maybe I can get it I out of him. I need to keep some stuff secret. Yeah. For I, myself. I totally understand. But I thought I would ask because I I, I watched it and. Yeah, no, no, no. I had to go through all of that stuff. Scott and I talked about that stuff, you know, about, you know, you know, when we, he was talking about, you know, when she goes back and she goes to the funeral and his ideas for, you know, what he thought that funeral looked like and what it was, what sort of things were there mm -hmm. and not just what she sees that giant you know that part memory me board up. that thing you know? that tears me up every time i watch that thing yeah it tore me up when they were working i was i would i would be let's say i was shooting over there like where oh Josh you were there is, when they were shooting and them? then over there where matt is there's like a couple of prop people working on this board so i'd be shooting a scene right here with with uh um 
Oh, don't she kill me or mama kill me. You know, the young woman who who I played opposite. The the woman that played Beth? Uh yeah. God, what's uh, her name? Uh, uh, it's with an A, isn't it? I well, no, it Anya that. is uh was her as a, when she was younger. Anyways, the brilliant actress I was working with, we'd be doing a thing and then over there they'd be making the placard board and I'd get up and I'd walk over and say, What are you guys doing? And I'd look and there was be this thing that was Yeah. Yeah, it was very moving. It was Yeah, I intense. felt like um I felt like when I was watching it, just analyzing it from that perspective, they're both alone. You know, here is this here is an orphan in this orphanage. And here's this man that seems he's playing chess alone. Probably doesn't have a lot of people in his life, you know, um, sitting back there. And I just thought to myself, wow, here are these two people completely alone in life and they find each other and they and they build this beautiful relationship with one another. I love all of the little things. Um, the, the way it was all written, that the, the send if you send me five dollars and we don't even see him, but he's alive in the story. She gets a letter and there's five bucks in it. And you're like, oh, my God, Mr. Scheibel is amazing. You know what I mean? And he sends her the money and all these sorts of things. And then we don't hear anything from him. Mm. And then we go, we find out that he dies and then we go to the funeral and then he goes back. She goes back and we see he's been following everything she's been doing like a father mm. proud father of this 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 i i feel like she had all of these she had foster parents but i feel like the real father was 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 him the way he you know he nurtured her you know and taught her everything he had, uh, she she knew and all of the accomplishments she ever had he put up on that wall um i mean he was just the picture kills me <laughs> you're by the way you're, you're your face okay was that planned your face in the picture because your face your... <laughs> yeah 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 it was, was there a thought, was yeah, there a totally. talk that went into that or or because absolutely because he, <laughs> he wasn't used to that kind of thing you know right like, yeah and, and back i mean we're used to photographs right yeah yeah people are snapping photographs of us all the freaking time <laughs> yeah yeah. you know josh was walking around with the camera you know, it's like <laughs> yeah. we do it all the time even when people don't we're, we're secretly taking pictures we take pictures of ourselves all the freaking time yeah right but that picture kills me. I took a picture me. of a loaf of bread this morning at six o'clock in the morning <laughs> to send to my friend in New Jersey, in in, in uh, whatever Montclair, right? Because yeah. I knew he'd be up. Because it it, it had a crazy name. It was called Bimbo Italian Bread. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, he'll get a kick out of this. Yeah. Right? Send him a picture. But back then, right? Photograph, especially for a guy like that guy. I mean, he spent 80% 80, 80 of his time in a basement. Yeah, your right? face kills me. That and the rest of it, he's not really paying attention to the people that he's 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 surrounded by these these lost souls, mm -hmm. right? But he doesn't really pay any attention to them. He just does his tasks. Yeah. He does have some pals, I guess, at the chess club, yeah. right? But no, the photograph was like, yeah, I'm glad you noticed that because it was like, it was like, yeah, no, he's not used to that at all. Like, what the what the fuck? It you know? <laughs> <laughs> he's got off guard. Like, what the fuck like, am I doing? Uh -huh. <laughs> it was really, it was really amazing. And then uh, it almost felt like it was a reaction. Actually, to he's her. on the run. He didn't want anybody to take the run. <laughs> he's in hiding. He's like, he's, <laughs> he suddenly realized, oh no, no. Yeah, it felt like it was almost a reaction to the hand. Cause she puts her hand on. She your, puts her hand on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She yeah. puts her hand on your shoulder, uh -huh. and then and then you turn, and and then and then the picture is taken. All of those little things in that show were just just wonderfully done. And then I don't know if this is true. Also, I wanted to ask you this because you would know. I don't remember exactly because I didn't like study every single episode. But when she leaves the orphanage, she gets into it with the car. Yeah. Is that the f only time in the series she cries? She breaks uh, no, down and no, I don't. She cry, doesn't she cry when she, at the funeral, when she gets in the car uh, with Moses? Um, and they go back to the orphanage and they're both older and they go to the funeral and she comes, it's after she's gone down to look at the basement. And right. Stuff, but, that, that and then she gets in the car then. Yeah, and she yeah, cries. Yeah, she cries. Is that, that's, that's the it. only part in the show she yeah, cries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought that was. Because I don't even think that. Unbelievable young, how yeah. that, I, and I'm sure that was on purpose here is this person who's never shed a tear mm -hmm. after all of the things she's been through mm -hmm. or being an orphan and all of the stuff that she's gone through to get to where she is and all of the difficulties in this young lady's life 
She never sheds a tear. Only time she sheds a tear is when she goes into the room after Mr. Scheibel is dead. And she breaks out and cries. I just thought it was wonderful. Yeah. Anyway, well, she's wonderful. great. Um, another one of your... Th okay, so... <laughs> sorry, I'm just like... I have like all these like fan questions. <laughs> I'm just like... <laughs> the another role you did was very, very, very small. It was in Birdman, where I, yeah. th I think they billed you as Crazy Man. That was the name of the character. <laughs> yeah. I think on IMDb it's called Crazy Man. Yeah. I was wondering how that came, because you're obviously, you know, you're a well-established yeah. actor. How did that... Not so much then. That was really the work of uh, the casting director, uh, Francine Maisler, who uh, cast that film. Mm-hmm. And has since cast me in a bunch of other things. Mm -hmm. Some I've been able to do, and some regretfully I have not been able to do. Uh, but uh, she, the, I was literally called, I think, the day before. They had lost the guy who was going to be playing Crazy Man. Or oh, there was something. somebody else that was supposed to yeah, be? Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, wow. Oh, yeah. That's the way it works. And they just called you in? Not for thing. everybody, but yeah. for me. <laughs> like, <laughs> but, yeah, they lost the guy, and... Uh, and then they call, uh, Francine called my agent, and my agent called me and said, hey, would you like to go? And I was like, sure, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, Alejandro mm -hmm. wrote... And you read too? But the director, yeah, yeah. Wrote three different uh, versions of the scene. Where you... Because you, you, in the film, I guess the one they picked, you were doing Macbeth, right? You, you, aren't you doing... Uh... Yes, you're I'm quoting. Doing, you're yeah. quoting from uh, when after Lady Macbeth dies. It's or whatever. tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Tomorrow and tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. that speech. Did he choose other things to do, or was it always that speech that you were doing? Uh, we oh. shot that. Um, I think he always knew that he wanted to use that speech because I think it had been also a theme somewhere else, right? But also <laughs> fitting, so fitting for that time. Oh, yeah. For in the film, for what, you know, Michael Keaton's character is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's perfect. Yeah. And I had played Macbeth before yeah. and knew the knew the speech. Right. And uh, was, you know, I was psyched. Yeah. And we were on 43rd between 8th and 9th, I think. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, yeah, he wrote three different versions of scenes where I'm, uh, I, I, I got in this weird position. I was actually stretching. <laughs> this, to be honest, I was stretching in between takes yeah. while he and, um, oh, you know, I'm so, I'm, I'm an idiot. The cinematographer. Oh, the, he's and, my favorite. Uh, P2, no, his what's his name? Oh, my it's, God. Uh, he's my favorite. I forget uh, his name. Uh, what? Matt, can you see the cinematographer uh, for, for Birdman? He's got a nickname, which is, uh, I mean, he's the most brilliant. Anyways, very serious dude. They were like, they were sort of uh, trying to figure out which weather, where they were going to seam the shot, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah. Because they had to seam it somewhere because they had to hide the seam. Right. Uh, or two scenes, the beginning and then the end of it. And so he, Michael would come down. And I was stretching, and he was like, "Oh, I love it. I like that. I like that weird, got it, got you know." It. So oh. I was in the fence, like doing some stretch. <laughs> it was actually a baseball stretch I used to do when I'd stretch my arm. Wow! Or Look get at that. stiff. I was just doing this. And first, I was like, first I was like this uh, Iraqi vet, and then I was, uh, I can't, there was another guy. But he was like, oh, then I was a guy that then, oh, it got really meta. Like, I like, I, I, at one point I was actually saying, hey, you're Michael Keaton. Oh. Hey, God. you're, and then I would say Michael's real name. And oh. then, and it was like, it started to get like, he wanted to see how far we could bust the, yeah, I guess the whole thing. Got it, got it, yeah. And then there was, uh, um, what do I, what do I say as he walks by? It's like something like, was that too much? Was yeah, was that top? too much? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was so trying was to give it? you. You said something I like, to, I was trying like, to give I'm you. I'm trying to give you like yeah, range. I was trying to give you range. Some range, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> and and uh, that's how it happened. It was like we just played around, you know. It was I was he had me do these different things, and then I went and recorded the, you know, with the boom guy. We did a, a, you know, me doing that monologue like three, four, five times. Amazing. At the top of my voice at like three in the morning. 
Yeah. The Matthew myth. Lebesky. Yeah. Emmanuel. Yeah, Emmanuel. Yeah. But he has a nickname. He's got a really crazy nickname. Yeah. Oh. What are you? Um, so. And Keaton is awesome. He was like that was that uh, was such an, an immense like privilege to work with that guy. Yeah, I he's mean, just he's, the nicest guy, and he's just easy and generous, and like makes you feel like. Well, he was brilliant in that film. And, he was brilliant. Yeah, incredible. That film. He's, I mean, unbelievable yeah. that that film. Yeah, and, and and I love everything Alejandro and Yuritu does. I mean, I love the Revenant. I love that the, the mm -hmm. cinematographer in the, in the Revenant. His work was just unbelievable. Yep. really, really amazing. Yep. Well, you are currently doing a play. Yep. My favorite play, by the way, of all time. No way. My favorite play really? of all time. I wow. love Long Day's Journey in Tonight. Yeah. I've worked on. <laughs> I've worked on in class. Jamie Edmund. Um, you know, just always working on both in, in some capacity, um, you know, working either in scenes or monologues. I just love the play. Mm -hmm. I've wanted to go to Connecticut and visit the house because mm -hmm. I know the house is there now. Everything yep. I've yep. Uh, studied, Eugene O'Neill, his life and everything, because you kind of have to when you're doing that play. It is basically his, you know, his his life in real life. Um, we actually saw it. It was wonderful. So very, very, very good job. And I love the modern take that you guys do on it. Mm -hmm. Really, really cool. I wanted to know what how the idea came about why did you guys decide to do it why this play and then whose idea was it to do the this version the current version of it that you guys are doing my wife cut it oh cool she cut it she started working on it a few years ago nice yeah amazing yeah so the uh, a lot of the a lot of the 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 fuel for for doing it was uh you know, the opioid problem we have in this country yep. and addiction mm -hmm. um, and alcohol is a drug. So it's all one mm -hmm. in that way. Obsessiveness, uh, compulsive behavior, dysfunctional behavior, familial resentment, all of the stuff that he writes about and that he didn't want published. It wasn't like he was writing a play either. I, yeah. He wanted actually to be done. It was, I think, more of a personal exercise. Mm -hmm. You know, I never spoke to him, but mm -hmm. it's my second time doing this play. I did a production mm -hmm. up in Cambridge mm -hmm. once with Stu Varg and Claire Bloom and Dan O'Hurley. And that was a more sort of traditional production. Mm -hmm. uh, and we didn't cut much. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was freaking four hours long. <laughs> it's, um, a, it's a monster of a play to do. There's a lot of fat. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of repetition. There's a lot of circuitous talking. There's a lot of, you know, it's it's uh, it's very literary. Yeah. You know, and so the idea was uh, that Beth had was to get to the kind of core action mm -hmm. thoughts, uh, events that were going on between them and what was happening. And so mm -hmm. as we did that, it sort of revealed itself, you know, mm -hmm. uh, where everything that's in there, as you well know, is everything that's in the play. Mm -hmm. And we didn't cut anything out right. as events, except right. for Kath uh, Kathleen. Kathleen. Yeah. yeah, and turned that into a monologue. Yeah. Because why did we need Kathleen? Right. Yeah, she's not in the play that often. She's just a sounding board. Yeah. Do you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in terms of, you know, she's she good, you know. So we streamlined it that way, and that was really best idea. And uh, she cut it. I would say she did, you know, 90% of that cut over the last few years. And she's, you know, wanted wanted to play Mary. She asked me if I wanted to play James, and I said, "Well, to act with you, of course." Yeah, that's. And nice. then uh, we did a few workshops of it. You know, we mm -hmm. did a workshop at the Public. We did a workshop at New York Theatre Workshop. Oh, nice. Um, and then, uh, you know, eventually, eventually, Audible was like, "Oh, let's do it." Yeah. And so it's a nice they theater. Too. Presented Manetta. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's good theater. It's a nice theater. Yeah, it's a nice size, I think, because no, there's no there's no bad seats in there. It's kind of nice. I disagree. Really? But uh, I think you know it depends how the stage is set up. Oh, I see. I think if you're down low in the front, mm 
-hmm. it's a little problematic. Oh, I think the okay. best seats in the house are in the first two rows of the balcony. Yeah, we sat in the balcony, so it was wonderful. Yeah, 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 yeah. So those are the, you know, those are the ones to be in. Do you prefer theater over um, film and TV, or does it really matter on the role for you? What's the most more fulfilling, I, I guess, a better question? Uh, I mean, right now, I don't ever want to go on a stage again. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but that's because I'm ready for this to be finished. Yeah. Um, are you guys towards the reasons. end of the run? <laughs> huh? Are you guys towards the end of the run? We have a week to go. A week to go. Okay. Uh, you know, I think I, I, uh, I think in my heart, I have a preference for theater, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure I want to act anymore. Oh, wow. On like the stage. Like, oh, got it. You know, maybe in some other capacity or, mm -hmm. or maybe there's, you know, one person that I would like to do something with. Mm -hmm. There's a guy I've collaborated with a few times mm -hmm. and uh, maybe we'll do something before we die. Is there a reason why you don't want to act on stage anymore? And, uh, there's, I probably, I, I don't really want to get into it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Yeah, but no, it was it, it was it was a wonderful production. If whoever's watching it, hopefully we'll we'll get this up by then. And uh, the last uh, yeah, no, last we're psyched is... the way that the audiences are responding, and you know, and that uh, people are coming. Yeah, definitely. Well, do you have anything film, TV wise, anything that we should be looking out for that's coming up soon? Are you working mm -hmm. on anything? Uh, yeah, I've been going back and forth doing uh, a guy I I did a movie Crown Heights with. Mm -hmm. Matt Ruskin, he's director. Uh, he's making a movie about the Boston Strangler at the moment. And so I've gone up a couple of times just to do uh, a day mm -hmm. to play, you know, a role because he asked me if I would if I would do that. And I was like, yeah, man, <laughs> for you, sure. Uh, I'm about to leave when I finish this. Mm -hmm. I'll have a couple of weeks off and then I'll go to New Orleans for a month mm -hmm. and do a movie that... Uh, I think it was in Deadline yesterday. Um, Maggie Betts is a director, writer, mm -hmm. and uh, she's worked with a great playwright, Doug Wright, Douglas Wright. Mm -hmm. You know him? I don't. He wrote a play called Quills no. uh, a number of years ago. He's, he's a brilliant writer, brilliant writer. Definitely read some of his stuff. He uh, wrote a, a movie script that... Uh, Jamie Wright and Tommy Lee Jones and um, uh, myself and uh, the woman uh, Smollett, who was in the Lovecraft County uh, television show. Not sure. She's wonderful. I'm forgetting her first name right now. Anyways, I'll do that in New Orleans for a month, and then I'll go to L.A. and shoot another movie. Uh, is there anything coming out? Uh, I can't, uh, yeah, well, at some point, it'll probably come out in the fall, I guess. I, I finished right before this, I finished, uh, doing Salem's Lot. Oh, interesting. The movie version of Stephen King's. Wow. Do you know, you know when that comes story. out? I think it's in the fall. Oh, nice. Yeah, That's I know that they're, they're, they're cutting it now and getting it all ready. Oh, well, that'd Maybe be... the summer, I don't know. That'd be a very good thing to look out for. Yeah, it'll be yeah. great. It'll be cool. Awesome. Be wicked. Well, thank you, Bill. This was really, really honestly amazing. I'm really happy you came and, and sat yeah. down and talked to us. It was really awesome. And um, I'm always just looking out for all the stuff you do. And so many of my friends are going to be excited to see this because everybody loves seeing your work. So thank you for I coming. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>